Welcome uh, to this new edition of the Data Science Seminar. It is our pleasure, Ras and myself, Ahmed, to host you today uh, for the seminar with the theme of Federated Learning uh, and how uh, it enables edge intelligence. We have four interesting talks from brilliant researchers and practitioners. But let me, before in, uh, listening to these interesting talks, let me quickly introduce uh, the university the Institute of Computer Science and our research group to our external participants and our, to our guest speakers. So the University of Tartu was established in 1632 and it's among the top 100 universities worldwide according to the Times Higher Education University ranking for 2021. And it's also uh, among the top 1% of the most cited universities in the world. The Institute of Computer Science consists of six chairs and 22 research groups uh, that are uh, all involved serving 1,400 students with 200 employees. The Institute offers nine postgraduate study programs, eight in the master's, and one PhD program. So uh, in this picture, you see uh, our uh, main uh, building for the university. And that building uh, is not back to 1632, unfortunately, but it's uh, old enough. It's, it's uh, from 1804, uh, uh, 18 1804. And it was built by the university's architect, Johann Wilhelm, Johann Wilhelm Krause. And no, our Institute of Computer Science is not in that building, but it is um, in our new Delta building, the one you see here in the picture. And as you can see also in this picture, it is in a walking distance from the main building of the Institute. So uh, in Delta, we have our, uh, it's a, a, a modern uh, building that is, was built in 2020. And it hosts our Institute of Computer Science um, along with other uh, institutes like Institute of Technology, Business Administration, and a number of startup companies. So, um, yeah, so uh, the name Delta, uh, don't be afraid, it's not coming from the COVID variant, but it's, it's named before that. Uh, it is for the Greek letter Delta, as you can see in the top left of the picture, because uh, the design of the building follows this uh, symbol. And unless it was for a COVID situation, a COVID pandemic, we would be glad to be hosting you physically in this uh, uh, nice building we have. So uh, our group, the data systems group that is uh, facilitating this edition of the seminar uh, was established uh, in 2018 uh, by Professor Sharif Sakr, who was a former head of the group, who uh, unfortunately passed away in 2020. And then uh, I got the honor to lead this group. Uh, and we have also a number of brilliant researchers and senior team consists of myself, Radwa and Firas, who is uh, uh, co-moderating this event uh, with me. Uh, our group works in, in many interesting topics related to data management. So we work in automated machine learning, uh, where we have built systems to run automated machine learning in both uh, centralized and distributed systems. We work in uh, stream processing, uh, building systems, and also online machine learning with data streams. Uh, distributed graph processing, uh, process mining, and uh, in general data mining pipelines. And recently, we are establishing a new line of research that will be led by Faraz, which is about edge intelligence. So uh, now I hand over to you, Faraz, so you can maybe briefly introduce the topic and introduce our speakers. So to you, Faraz. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Ahmed, for uh, this. Uh nice introduction uh, about uh, our uh, research facilities, our research group here in the University of uh, Tartu. Um, as Ahmed said, uh, uh, due to the pandemic, uh, we couldn't host uh, in, a, in a similar uh, way, but we uh, really hope to host you here personally in this uh, nice building besides the river in uh, Delta Research Center, Tartu, uh, Estonia. 
So uh, welcome again for uh, this new series of uh, the Data Science Seminar hosted by the Institute of Computer Science University of, uh, of Tartu. So uh, today uh, title will be Federated Learning, the Future of Edge Intelligence is Now. And in, in, this, in this title, uh, we can see two main um, names, Federated Learning and Edge Intelligence. So um, in, in, in a brief, just to uh, create like a common understanding uh, and common uh, ground uh, for these terms, um, artificial intelligence usually took place over centralized uh, repositories of, uh, of data. Uh, the more data you have, the more uh, sophisticated algorithms you can uh, run. However, with the advent of new uh, paradigms, including the IoT, and the development in the edge devices at the edge of the networks, uh, we, we start uh, unleashing more services and more operations at the edge uh, of, of the network. And federated learning is, is a way of do distributed uh, machine learning with privacy by design uh, features that our uh, very expert um, uh, speakers today uh, will, will give us and it will enlighten us uh, with this new uh, paradigm and this new modern uh, architectural deployment model. Um, so back in October 2020, uh, Forbes article uh, labeled federated learning uh, as one of the three uh, emerging areas that will shape the next generation of AI technologies. And we are mainly today here to talk about uh, this a new shifting of, of big data and data analytics toward more decentralized um, architectures. So the, as a humanity, we keep allocate more and more data coming from different sources. And alongside that, the number of um, IoT devices in the network's edge keep increasing tremendously. Like we're uh, booming in the number of uh, data allocated and the number of uh, sources where we allocate this data from. And if you can see from these uh, two figures, um, how, how, how big is our data and how variant uh, from different resources, more than 50 billion device by 2020 uh, in, in IoT, in sensors, um, far at the edge and fog of the network. And the um, big data analytics, the more, data you allocate, the more happy the administrators will be. Um, and who consume more data than uh, the network edge these days? So the growing uh, and more development in, in one area will lead to the development in, in the whole data analytics. Traditionally, um, as I said, like we, we used to allocate the data from different resources, but we only make some um, few processes like uh, labeling or uh, uh, pre-processing uh, at, at the network edge. So here we have three layers, the far edge, the internet of things, the edge gateways and the cloud. So the allocated raw data uh, processing, making them information took place in the edge, but that extracting knowledge, uh, having patterns and make data analytics for, for different applications were only located at the cloud. However, these days, uh, currently we can see that th this data operational uh, architecture has shifted and we can, and knowledge and information can take place in, in early stages of that allocation at the networks um, edge. And the goal here is to build knowledge and extract analytics and patterns and make trends uh, and relations from all of this allocated data. Uh, and with this, we want to make local decisions. At the end of the day, intelligence, artificial intelligence uh, means or indicates making decision making at the right time, the right decisions and in time. And with time latency applications that need to, to uh, reflect in, in real time and streaming, um, the more uh, close to your data where has it been allocated, the more uh, fast latency you will, your application will, will, will be. 
So after that, we aim to share this knowledge, the extracted knowledge among peers, imagine an intelligent transportation system or many other smart city, smart everything uh, architecture. So start sharing these knowledge among the, the, the peers and evolve like keep learning, keep improving the accuracy performance uh, ethic. Uh, a novel way to do that is uh, federated learning. Federated learning is a privacy by design machine learning technique that train algorithms across multi uh, decentralized edge devices or servers holding uh, local data samples. So you don't need to, to share your, your, da your data without exchanging them at all. So it enables multi -actor to actors to, to build a common and a robust uh, dis distributed machine learning uh, model without sharing um, the data. Our expert today will, will emphasize and will uh, discuss uh, more about uh, these uh, architectures and these uh, frameworks. Uh, but in brief, uh, we have two main families, the server orchestrator, federated learning and fully decentralized uh, architectures. So the, the main idea here is that um, the server, which could be in the cloud or fog, will select a model to be trained and will send it to the edge nodes. So it is a common model among all uh, edge clients. Um, clients will start the learning phase on the, on the data located uh, locally. So on the local data um, alone, it will learn, it will run several uh, learning um, rounds and it will share just uh, some few updates with the server, for instance, the weight of the model to be uh, fusion or uh, average uh, or using any different uh, algorithm to enhance uh, the experience, improve the accuracy and this, Updated weight can be sent back to the edge nodes to run another uh, round of, of learning with the updated uh, weight. This can be also done decentralized, fully decentralized architecture, but uh, our speakers today may, mainly maybe will focus more in the server orchestrated federated learning uh, model. So, Today, we have a very distinguished and first class uh, speakers uh, that will, will talk us and will discuss uh, this uh, trend, uh, the decentralized distributed federated learning and machine learning. And we will discuss some uh, concerns and challenges besides opportunities of such uh, realm. Um, so in the first speak, uh, Dr. Andreas, uh, an associated professor in University of, of Uppsala and the founder of uh, Scaleout uh, Company, will showcase uh, Feedin. Uh, Feedin is a, an open source uh, framework for scalable federated uh, machine learning. Uh, next, Professor uh, Peter from uh, the Computer Science Department at uh, Kayaset. Uh, university uh, will discuss uh, two main concerns in, in this new wave of decentralized data analytics, um, namely uh, error feed, feedback, uh, also known as uh, error compositions, uh, which is a popular convergence stabilization mechanism uh, in the context of distrib distributed uh, learning of uh, supervised machine learning. And follow to that, uh, Aaron, the CEO and founder of uh, Riot Security in, in Sweden, will, will tell us more about the associated security and privacy uh, concerns with, 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 the, with this uh, shifting of, of data analytics uh, toward more uh, networks uh, edge. Finally, uh, Dr. Assam uh, from uh, Concordia University, Canada, uh, will uh, demonstrate how to enable uh, atomic graph learning uh, for uh, advanced and semantic data uh, discovery. So um, allow me on behalf of uh, University of uh, Tartu and the Data Research uh, System Group uh, to welcome all of our uh, brilliant uh, speakers and uh, I'd like to thank them uh, for uh, sharing their time and knowledge uh, with us uh, today. 
A few reminders for all uh, attendants and participants, uh, kindly uh, and gently reminder to keep your uh, microphones uh, muted. Uh, this session uh, will be uh, recorded and sooner we will uh, upload uh, the recording on the website. And please, if you have any question about uh, the, the, the topics uh, that our speakers will uh, represent, uh, write your questions in the, in the chat and I will take care to hand them uh, to, the, to the speaker at the end of uh, each uh, speaker uh, slot. So um, thank you uh, once more, and uh, we can start with uh, Dr. Uh, Andreas. Uh, so floor and uh, mic uh, is yours. Thank you so much for us. Um, I hope you can see and hear me well still. Confirmed. Yes, thank you for that very nice introduction. And now I feel really curious to also visit art. I see we have a lot in common, old university. We used to be in old, very nice buildings uh, when we moved to a big new glass building. So we are also going to move in January from the old regiments in Uppsala where we are currently sitting. Uh, so it seems to be a lot, lot in common as we know. Uh, just a little bit more introduction. Um, yeah, like you said, I'm an associate professor in scientific computing. I run a research lab in uh, at the Department of Information Technology there. We call it the Integrative Scalable Computing Laboratory. Um, and I run this together with some other talented researchers, uh, PIs called Prashant Singh and Salman Tour. Um, we do a quite diverse set of topics, but they tend all to connect to distributed scientific computing and cloud computing in one way or the other. Um, and then usually with applications in scientific computing. And as you said, I also have founded together with some great partners, a company called Scalo Systems, where we focus on taking federated learning systems to production. Uh, and this is what I will talk about today, a bit with FedN, our, our project around uh, software project for federated learning. So just a little bit more about the company. It was founded a couple of years ago um, by myself and two colleagues, Salman and Ola at the university, and then three guys from the entrepreneurial background, Jens and Daniel and Morgan. And I wanted to highlight Morgan here uh, because Morgan is not just his business, he's also very technical and he has written a large part of the Fed and code base. Uh, so what you see today, he has made a substantial contribution to also. Uh, yes, but uh, what are we trying to do? Well, what, what is the problem? And you already introduced this for us, right? The problem with centralized machine learning is that uh, we need to pool data in order to train models, simply put. Uh, and this can be a problem for many reasons. You, you covered now the edge intelligence use case. Uh, which is problematic, uh, I mean, both due to privacy and due to uh, the cost of essentially moving data into the core network, through the core network. Uh, but, um, but we also have, say, privacy, privacy problems uh, also, say, when, say, hospitals are trying to collaborate in machine learning. Uh, we have sensitive data there that cannot be shared in an easy way. So there is a very costly and time-consuming process in that case to create, for example, bio data banks uh, with, and you need to anonymize data. Um, you have the case of regulated data with GDPR, which, are, which is a big issue, of course. Um, so we have this kind of situation now where we have had a decade of tool development that are really good for centralized, uh, for the big data paradigm, uh, but we are seeing a lot of problems with that. Uh, so federated learning promises uh, to solve this to some extent. Um, and I like to show this slide because this is important to understand sort of what is it that we are expecting from federated learning. What we are hoping is that by using federated learning, we are going to be able to produce uh, a machine learning model that are on par with the theoretical model that you could have obtained if you were able to pool the data, or at least almost as good. I mean, that, that would be, uh, there would be a trade-off there, the cost of organizing this data pooling versus using federated technology. Uh, and certainly you want to achieve something that is much better than what you could have accomplished each of the individual members with, let's call it a federation in, on their own. Uh, so the picture to the right here is a, a study we like to show. We, we done it, it's based on a, it's a classification problem where the task is to classify 
the stage and type of, of cancer cells. And this is a typical graph, this convergence graph that, you, that I show here is typical for what you see in this type of um, image classification problems. Uh, here we have had a big data set that was split into 10 partitions. So we were able, we, we had a data set that we could train centralized models. And we did that and that's the orange orange curve. So that's the, the, the baseline performance of the standard uh, way of doing things. And then if we use federated learning, which is the green curve, uh, uh, we obtain something that is equally good in the end, but uh, converges a little bit slower in the beginning. And then the blue curve there is the best model we were able to train on one single of these partitions. So this is like the, the mental picture we should have uh, in that case. And I just wanted to name, there was a name there in the graph, federated averaging, and there's uh, not time in this talk to go into the depth here, but of course there is a emerging rich sort of uh, theory around this, and it really ties back, this is a distributed optimization. Um, but in principle, uh, very simply put, federated training proceeds in rounds, so we will use that name, the rounds. Um, and in every round, clients will update Will, will achieve, uh, they will obtain the latest current global model and they will compute some sort of update on that uh, by doing say one full epoch of training or, or a few steps of training. Here the details can vary a lot depending on the algorithm and the scheme that you're using. And then there is some aggregation scheme at the end of this round where these models are onto the next generation global model. And then this was this. The federated averaging is, was, was one of these earliest and there's a paper you can read about that there that sort of outlines the, this and thus experiments in theory. Uh, and here you use a very uh, simple way to average the scheme essentially to aggregate these models. Uh, but you can look at that. And if we look at federated learning from the sort of bigger picture of privacy preservation, we can say that federated learning helps with what is called input privacy. Um, so this is about protecting the data that comes into the training, the training data. And it's done in, in the simplest possible way by making sure that the data never leaves the data owner's own premises. So whatever security measures you have around your data, it will still be valid because it's not moving. Uh, it will not be much better uh, than what you had before for your own data, but it will, will not be worse. Um, it's often tied into discussions about you know, this research domain ties in also the problem of output privacy, where uh, which is about, okay, what can you learn by using the model about the input data? Uh, but this is a general problem in machine learning or, or any type of, of computation. Uh, but this is often discussed together. But I think the, the concept you should try to remember there is that we have uh, an elegant way of, of promising to address input privacy. So uh, what we are doing uh, in our group is focusing a lot on scalable machine federated learning. Uh, so we are developing a open source software called the FedM, uh, where, which, which we do then a lot of our research around. And this is an implementation is based on, on an idea called hierarchical federated learning. Uh, what we have focused a lot on is, because this is also tied to the work we do in the company and, and since we are a distributed computing group, we have focused primarily initially on production grade features, scalability and aspects of distributed computing uh, rather than uh, very many different features in machine learning. But it's a framework agnostic, so you can use it with any uh, machine learning framework you want essentially, uh, and you can run it on distributed infrastructure. And there's a link here uh, to the GitHub page and then to an archive paper, we can read more. So the rest of the talk will be about our sort of contribution to this domain then. And to see what we are doing, we get back to this problem of scalability. I think for us touch upon this initially. So this picture here is the typical picture we see about federated learning. And, and this was called now before here, uh, server-based uh, federated learning, which is the most common type. Uh, so we have some sort of server that uh, coordinates computations amongst clients that are then aggregated. And this is, of course, a very, very common pattern in all sorts of uh, computing or distributed computing. But we have problems here, right? We have the problems that uh, weak connections may lead to communication bottlenecks. Um, and this will happen a lot in, in edge computing, of course. 
for this example with hospitals, for example, where you might have very large models, uh, you also have uh, the same type of bottlenecks arising from, uh, from the communication bottleneck and also like the actual disk IO on the server will become a problem and, and the cost of aggregating. So in, in principle, the server eventually becomes a bottleneck to scalability. Uh, and then there are, of course, uh, two very simple or two ways you can proceed solving this in principle, right? Um, if we disregard the, the centralization, the fully decentralized scheme. So one option which you see in literature is that you um, essentially, if say that you have a very large number, 10,000, 100,000 clients, in each round you simply subsample the amount of clients that you can handle on the single server that you have. Uh, and then you proceed doing this in different, you can do different sampling strategies. And this, this you will find in, in the research literature. Uh, but the drawback, the, the pro of this is that it's very simple. You still have the simple setting with a single server. You can use almost any type of, I mean, there's, there's so many frameworks you can use for, for coordinating this type of computation. And there are production grade mice. Um, but, um, but it is better, of course, to use as many clients as possible during the update stage. So the other solution which we take is, is very simple in theory. You just add more servers, you add more aggregators, right? Um, and do updates in a hierarchical fashion. And this is a very simple idea, but that of course leads to a lot of complexity on the system level. So that's the price you pay. But this is the, the model that we have implemented in FedN and it's uh, called hierarchical federated learning. Uh, and this is a conceptual picture of this. So we, uh, we have essentially three tiers, three logical tiers in the computation. We have clients that are doing updates of the models, and then we have combiners, which are aggregation servers. And each combiner, they have responsibility of a subset of clients in the, in the federation, and they are dealing with those independently of, of the other combiners. So they are essentially acting fairly, very independently during a round. And then each of these combiners, they will produce a combiner level uh, federated model that is then aggregated by in, in a final redu reduction step by a, a component we call the reducer. And this can be in the simple case of all reduce, which is what we have now. It's actually a, a, a server a service that just pulls in the models from combiners and aggregates them on the second tier. Um, but it can also be um, a decentralized protocol, for example. It could be gossiping or or it could be something else, it could be ring or reduce. So these things can be implemented. But the point being that those then happen on the combiner level, not the client level. And the combiners are significantly less uh, number than the, the clients. Uh, this picture then of course reduces to the simple setting of, of the one server federated average in case if you just have one combiner. So this is another way to look at the architecture just to reiterate uh, in FedM you have some tiers where you have the controller stage on the top level, uh, which essentially lays out the computational plan. Um, it provides discovery services for the client. So if a client connects to the federation, they get assigned to one, one combiner and there's an algorithm for assigning this that you can extend. Um, there's some database service needed to, uh, to essentially manage the connections of, of all the clients and combiners in the network. Um, this can be, in the vanilla frameworks in the framework, it can be an, a normal, we use MongoDB for this. Uh, but we also have um, pilot implementations where we use, say, blockchains to in increase security there. Yeah, so this is essentially the picture. This is what we do. And um, then what we gain here is, of course, that by using this model, we can replicate the number of combiners and scale horizontally very, very widely. And if you have a background in computing, you will also realize that what we, the picture we showed before uh, makes you think, so think about the map reduce programming model. Uh, and that is no coincidence. It, it's sort of related to that in a way. And it also means that it will scale very well. So this is the picture. Uh, this is another way to look at this. So what this also enables is highly decentralized networks that you can deploy with FedM. Um, and what, what is good with this is that you can then deploy these combiners, say, close to a group of clients geographically, if you need low latency, for example. So say that you have 
a use case with autonomous vehicles that are going to do some sort of fleet intelligence. Um, you could have one combiner in Uppsala and one in Turkey uh, to manage the connections to cars in Estonia and Sweden. Um, and then we can have some uh, another tier of, of learning then between the combined levels. And this can be very powerful for uh, wide scalability in that sense. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to relate back really quickly to the pictures that, that you have there for us that one can say that we are not fully decentralized in the sense that we have single clients coordinating things uh, independently. Uh, we still have coordination layers, but what we have is then this, we have essentially decentralization on the combiner level. So we have like a hybrid model here, if you wish, uh, that I think strikes a very good balance between pragmatic, uh, you know, production grade features and um, a high level of distribution. Uh, so there is a paper uh, on archive um, with some experimental results and that describes this framework and the rest of the talk I was just going to highlight some of these experiments that we have done. Um, so the first experience we do with the paper is, is a cross device situation where we look at okay but what is the performance of these combiners this aggregator service this is important so how, what resource requirements do we have to put on these components? Um, so here we used, we have a postdoc called Saudi al uh, in my group that has implemented a, developed a, a use case based on human daily activity recognition. Uh, so this is a very small model, it's 250 KB. Um, and here we are using this then to explore, um, yeah, cross device like experiments, but we have still done the experiments in, in a cloud where we sort of simulate uh, many, many clients. Then. And the first experiment we did was to look at, okay, what can, how much load can we put on a single combiner if it's a fairly uh, normally equipped machine that runs the combiner server. Uh, so here we took a virtual machine with eight CPUs and 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, and these are the results. So we can see that we can feasibly, I would say handle up to thousands of clients on, on a single combiner like this and, and not sort of choke on the aggregation. Um, so this was, was quite nice. Um, uh, we also looked at the space, but we fixed it to 600 clients and then we looked at, okay, what, how, how low can we go in hardware requirements on the combiner? Uh, so you can see that even a, a combiner using a single core um, can handle uh, some of the load or a lot of the load. But here you can also see the strength of being able to replicate combiners because you can also show them that um, if you fix the number of resources you use, um, it's better to say use three, three very small combiners than one large uh, that are using the same amount of hardware in total. Uh, we can do these experiments with, with virtual machines um, because then you have, first of all, better performance, but also much more resilience. Um, and just as a curiosity, then you can see to the right, this is from the UI of Fed, and you can also follow the, uh, the distribution here of um, how client update times are spread in the, in the network. So you have, of course, heterogeneity in, uh, in the um, training times of the devices. And this is, this is actually a very interesting aspect of very good learning that also calls for a lot of research that I don't have time to talk about today. Yeah, but this is a cross side thing. And what we're doing next here, what Saad is working on is uh, essentially doing more elaborate sort of network modulation experiments where we test more of the robustness of it. And he's also currently building a test bed based on this, um, this uh, example with yes and nano devices in our lab. So that will be interesting to see this in, in real life settings. So how much time do we have left for us? Uh, so uh, you can like have more two to three minutes yeah, perfect, uh, because perfect. I have a couple of questions here in the. That's perfect. Yes. Um, so the final thing I wanted to say also, we looked at the cross silo case, which is not the topic of this seminar, but it's still interesting, I think. And here the access, this is was done by a postdoc called Adi, uh, Maluk in our data set. And here we looked at an NLP task and downstream task with sentiment analysis. And what we did here, we were interested to see, okay, how does the framework cope with models of increasing size? So we did experiments where we varied the model size, and this was a, a CNN, uh, from 10 megabytes to one gigabyte. Um, 
and saw how the how this this could go up. And here we did real life experiments in Amazon EC2, and we used quite high end VMs for the combiners uh, for throughout experiments to see if I'm 4x large. This is a, a good compute flavor in in Amazon, uh, non GPU equipped. First assignment to check. Uh, we skipped this. We just checked that the framework computes the correct thing, which is thus. Uh, but then we looked at sort of, okay, we expect a linear scaling in, if things are done well uh, with increasing model size, because we are essentially linear increasing the amount of data that needs to flow through the combiner and that needs to be aggregated in each round. And this is also what we see. And then you see, so these four, first four bars here, they are uh, round times in the combiner where, where we keep increasing the data set size. Uh, and then the two last ones are where we then add one or two more combiners. So you can see you can bring down this time, you can scale, essentially show that you can do horizontal scaling. Um, finally, uh, we did this all in a very large experiment with one gigabyte models uh, up and 40 clients spread across four different availability zones or regions in, in Amazon Cloud and essentially showed that you could also by doing this kind of combiner scaling uh, achieve very high data flow through the FedN framework. Uh, but the details here you can read about in the paper. Yeah, so this is the, the, the thing I wanted. So yeah, the final thing there is that we also looked at the framework performance. Okay, what is the overhead of the actual framework? This is important when you characterize a, a system you build. And uh, just to keep it short, uh, this brown little slice here that is one percent other. That is the one that you want to be small. That all, the, all the rest is related to the actual machine learning part, the federated learning part. And the brown thing is the system overhead. And that is, is very small. So that is nice. Yeah, and I think this is where I will conclude. I hope you got some overview of federated learning and a little bit about the work we are doing. And if you want to talk more to me, there's a Discord server in Sweden we have with where we talk about the centralized AI and, and I will, I'm usually there every day, so we can. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Andreas. In fact, uh, this was yes. very informative and I just want to remind you that uh, the recording and the uh, presentations like a PDF of these presentations will be uploaded into our university uh, website uh, if anyone oh. wants to get back to those repositories. In fact, we have, a lot of questions myself uh, i had a couple of questions but i will keep um i as i promised i will handle uh, i will hand the questions from the audience we have a question from uh, ahmad uh, sabah suhail and nuvan and uh, uh, champerg rashid so we have a lot of questions but i will try to to pick some of the common uh, ones uh, among them so one was um, uh, how much the machine learning model uh, that presented in federated learning scheme uh, need to be homogeneous in terms of the type, like we were talking about uh, the, the, the model about the capacity out, uh, output uh, representation, um, ETIC. And Sabah had uh, a question about the malicious clients. Uh, how can we also uh, handle that in uh, a federated learning uh, scheme? Mm -hmm. So I'll start with the first one. If I understand the question correctly, I think it's about sort of how, how what do we need to require from the model for this to work? Um, and then there are two types of federated learning. There's horizontal, which is what I talked about today, and then there's vertical federated learning. And here, horizontal, we partition based on the data. So here we, we actually need to have the same model structure on, in this, at least in this type of training that I talked about now, you need to have the same input and output structure um, on all of the devices. Um, maybe this could be relaxed in some special situations, but this is how it's usually like now. Um, whereas there are more flexibility if you consider a, a vertical case, then you can also have different. But of course, you could also do federated ensembles and things like that. So these are also experience. And then, then the, the, you don't need to have the same type of models. Um, if I understand that question correctly, and the other one was about malicious clients. And yes. Yeah, and that one is, first of all, I should say that is not one of my own speciality areas, but um, I think it is a tricky problem uh, for sure, uh, because you cannot really know and control too much about the client at the client level, because that's sort of 
is the whole thing. We we are trying to be let them be private. Yes, uh, um, maybe uh, are... Ar Arnon, uh, who is the creator of uh, Riot Secure, will talk yeah, us more exactly. about the security. But I can say one thing that, that that there are of course modifications of these aggregation schemes that are trying to detect uh, whether an update from a given client is non-conforming, for example, to what it has been done before or, or very different from the others. Uh, and then you can have like, you know, weight it down so that it doesn't influence the global model as much. But there is of um, course a problem there that maybe this is because it has valuable data. This is why it's different. So this is a bit tricky, but this you can, we're also looking into using TE, trust execution environments. Uh, that's that's true. And uh, given that, even that we are already uh, yeah. exceeding yeah. our uh, time yes. window, but um, Ahmed here have a very good question. Uh, so in, in your uh, slides, you discussed about cross uh, devices architecture and to make it clear for uh, our general audience, uh, we have these two also architecture, um, the difference between cross silos and cross devices. In cross silos, the number of participants could be like in tens, where in the cross devices, uh, the, the clients and the edge nodes could be hundreds, thousands, and maybe sometimes more. So I had a question was about uh, this multi-layer of aggregation mm. in the combiner and uh, the, the final stage of aggregation. So won't this add uh, more latency uh, where you have several layers of aggregation? Yeah, it could. I mean, it, it introduces a little bit of, of coordination requirement there. Um, but what we see in practice is that, uh, you know, this is a way to scale. So that is important. And I think one thing I would, I would like to say about this model we have chosen is also, um, if you go to a fully decentralized setting, then you essentially need a small server on every client, which we don't. We can have extremely thin training clients, and then you, you have a little bit more requirement in the combine. That's true. But so, yeah, uh, yeah, I think it does, but but there's no getting around it, I think. You have to scale some way, right? So uh, please feel free to answer other questions in, yeah, in, in, in the chat if you have time to. Uh, thank you once more, uh, Andreas. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. Um, now we will uh, move on to our next uh, talk uh, by Professor Peter uh, Rich Tarek. Uh, he is a professor of computer science at the uh, King uh, Abdullah University of Science and Technology, Kaiset. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm super excited uh, of uh, hosting and representing uh, Professor Peter as he's uh, one of the leaders and, uh, uh, and he's an optimization uh, leader in in um, distributed machine learning. And uh, if, if I'm not uh, wrong, he's not all, also uh, a leading and a thinker in federated learning, but he's one of the original developers of who defined uh, the federated learning terms and its uh, boundaries. So uh, uh, welcome, uh, Professor Peter. Uh, today you will uh, represent uh, one of your very recent uh, publication, like it's uh, only one or two months ago. Uh, on the error track in this decentralized machine learning. So Mike, with you. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. <clears throat> uh, and thanks for the invitation to this uh, beautiful web webinar. So I will talk about something very, very narrow. Federated learning to me is a broad field. Essentially, almost all the research that we do in my team uh, is on federated learning. So I, I will not be doing an overview talk of what's in it. I'll, I'll focus on one tiny aspect of it, but I'll try to explain it in more detail so that you have some appreciation of these technologies behind federated learning and what is known, what is not known, and uh, what are the bottlenecks and issues that we we're facing. This is about error feedback. I'll explain what error feedback is and why is it important. So if you've never heard that term, it's okay. And EF21 is error feedback from year 2021. So we tried to redefine this algorithm and call it EF21 because we figured out a way how to do this in a better way, both in theory and in practice. And it's also simpler. And it was an open problem for a number of years, actually, since error feedback as a mechanism was developed in 2014. And in this year, we we, we, in some sense, fix this mechanism. And I will explain why this mechanism is really crucial 
uh, aspect of agility learning. So this is John work with Igor Sokolov, who is a student in my team, and Ilyas Fatkulin, who was a, an intern in my team. So here we are. So federal learning uh, is not at all. And so the, the, the term was coined just uh, five years ago. And uh, uh, federal learning grew from collaboration between Google team led by Brendan McMahon, shown in the center, my student Jakub Konichny, who is now working at Google, and myself. So here are some of the most uh, uh, cited papers from my own team and they're all on federal learning. So these are from our point of view, uh, the papers that started this plus a couple of papers from, from Google. Let me introduce uh, one of the formulations of federated learning. And in some sense, this is both cross device and cross silo federated learning. Uh, but typically people think of this as the cross silo federated learning setup. So this is the, Issue here is that you have end devices which collaborate. So this could be mobile phones or hospitals and so on. And they want to train a single model X, which is uh, definable through D parameters or D features. So these could be the weights in a neural network. And what we want to do when we train a federated learning model, we want to find a model X, which uh, minimizes the prediction error or minimizes some, some um, quantity of interest across uh, all of these devices in this average type of form. So we want the average performance to be uh, as good as possible, the average error to be as small as possible. And in this talk, I'm not going to assume anything about the homogeneity or heterogeneity of the data, which gives rise to these individual loss functions FIs on devices I, because this talk applies to any, any type of heterogeneity. So we don't suffer from the heterogeneity problem here in a certain sense. So the key method behind uh, federal learning uh, is uh, gradient descent. So this is really the key method and everything that people are trying to do is some enhancement of uh, gradient descent. So I want to explain gradient descent first so that I can talk about the enhancement that, we, that, uh, the, that is uh, error feedback 21. So gradient descent is this idea that you want to get down uh, to this volume, you want to minimize a certain function. So this is the lost surface, let's say of your neural network. And you want to find the parameters down there on the bottom because they will, they will lead to a model which minimizes the prediction error. And the way you try to get to that model is roughly follow this black path, which is a path that, path that water would actually follow if it was flowing down this hill. And I, we, we try to trace this path uh, in a computer using method called gradient descent. And it's an iterative technique which moves from xt to xt plus one in this way. Uh, and what we do is that we take uh, the model xt and we subtract a multiple of the negative, or, or we subtract a multiple of the gradient because uh, negative gradient is direction of descent. So we go down the hill. And gamma is some learning rate which defines somehow the distance between xt and xt plus one. If we write down exactly the same method in this setup of having n clients, the method looks like this. And this is because the gradient of average of loss functions is the average of the gradients. So that's all that is to it. The summation or averaging and gradient, they commute. Uh, so how would we implement gradient send in the federated uh, regime? So let's say we have three machines, three edge devices. All of them have a copy of the current model, XT, that's model at iteration T or time T. They compute these local gradients based on, based on their local data and send this to this orchestrating server. The server can average these orange or yellow uh, gradients. These are D-dimensional vectors. And D is huge because modern uh, networks that we want to train, they really depend on many, many parameters. Uh, this averaging is then done on the server and the server sends back, broadcasts back this uh, model XT plus one. So one of the main bottlenecks, but by far no, the only one, and this is why federal learning is a very interesting and active field, uh, uh, one of the main bottlenecks of, uh, of, of this federated environment is that the communication between these edge devices and the server is very, very slow. And that, that's why one has to be very careful about what one is communicating. And in particular, you don't want to be communicating all of the uh, parameters of, of uh, all of these gradients, because this, this could be uh, megabytes, gigabytes, uh, and, and for huge, huge models, uh, even more. Uh, per client. So this, this could be huge amounts of data. 
So what you want to do, one of the tricks that people came up with, and this is one of the intrinsic uh, um, uh, mechanisms behind uh, all the algorithms that are useful in practice, uh, including federated averaging, is uh, communication compression. So the idea is that you don't send the gradients, but you send compressed gradients, but you don't use compression of the type of zip or something like this. You use uh, certain mathematical compression mechanisms which uh, lead to loss of information. So it is not possible using uh, some decompression mechanism to exactly rec recover the gradient that you sent. So in fact, by applying these compression mechanisms and they have this mathematical contractive compression uh, property that is uh, shown here on the slide, uh, we actually uh, change the method. This is no longer gradient descent. This is called compressed gradient descent or distributed compressed gradient descent. And then one may wonder, is this change of gradient descent which is aimed at reducing the communication loads, is it going to lead to a method that can still uh, actually find the uh, optimal model that can go down the wall and find the, the minimum point? So the short answer is no, it cannot. So this method can actually diverge and it can diverge exponentially fast. And there's a very simple counter example that we found a year ago with just three functions and three parameters and we can easily just see the full explanations here. I'm not going to go through it, but this is the full explanation and the proof of divergence in this case. So this, the fact that uh, compressed gradient descent can diverge was known already since 2014. And this is why the error feedback mechanism was uh, proposed in the first place. But before I explain what error feedback does, let me give you some examples of these compression operators. So the compression operators could uh, compressed because they sparsify or because they do some sort of low-rank approximation or quantization. Uh, but I will just uh, give examples of the top K and random K sparsifiers now. So the top K compressor works like this. So let's say you want to compress a five-dimensional vector. So this could be the weights of a neural network. So this is a very tiny neural network just with five weights. So nobody would actually want to train such a network. And let, but let's imagine that instead of five weights, we have uh, 50 million or, or, or 5 billion weights here. So this is much more practical. And then what you do by applying this top one compressor, because K is one now, so top K is top one, is that you only retain one entry and the largest one in absolute value and everything else you zero out. So you can clearly see the, you lose almost all the information in what you wanted to send. You wanted to send this kind of gradient, but you send this instead. So this has the contractive property shown on the upper right with the alpha parameter one over five. It's always K over D, where D is the dimensionality of the problem. Uh, if your K is two, you choose the two largest entries in absolute value is three, the three largest, and, and, and as K increases, you compress less and less, and what you send is more and more similar to uh, what you actually wanted to send in order to learn gradient descent. And the difference between the two is called the error, and because of the error, the method could actually diverge. So the random K compress is very similar, except you don't choose the entry which is largest in absolute value, just pick a random entry. So this is just, you flip a coin with probably one over five or, or throw, throw a dice, and, and this is what you get. All right, so what is uh, error feedback? Error feedback is the mechanism which fixes this divergence of uh, uh, gradient descent, which is enhanced, so to speak, with uh, compression. Enhanced because, in fact, if uh, the enhancement leads to divergence, it's not an enhancement at all. But fortunately, we know how to fix divergence and the mechanism was proposed in 2014. So some years before even federal learning as, 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 as a term appeared by Frank Seide and, and co-authors. So you can see here in this underlying sentence, they call this the error feedback mechanism. Uh, this is influential paper and they already train uh, a deep neural network with, with 50 million parameters. This was uh, many years ago and so on and so forth. And they really needed to be doing um, compression of, of the messages that they were sent because otherwise this would be way too uh, difficult. So let me explain what error feedback does. Error feedback is something like gradient descent, actually something like compressed gradient descent, except you want to remember the error that you make by compressing and sending the compressed message instead of the true message. You want to remember the difference and then you want to add it to the message in the next iteration. So that's the idea. So again, at the beginning, the error is zero. And because the error is zero, then W0 is just compressed gradient. So in the first iteration, you just send compressed gradient. But then you realize you sent a compressed gradient, W0, but what you actually wanted to send is the gradient. 
because at the beginning, this is zero, right? So this is the full gradient. So this is the difference between what you wanted to send and what you actually sent, and you remember it and call it ET plus one. And at the next iteration, you add it to the gradient. That's why the ET is here in the first place before compression, and then you compress the sum of the two. And you hope that by adding always the error uh, to the next uh, message before compression, you, you're going to compensate for it. So this is why this is called error compensation or error feedback. Here is how the method looks like when you run it on N machines rather than one machine. So this is just a single machine scenario, but in fact, the, the generalization to the distributed setting is completely trivial, so I will not even go through it. Uh, but it turns out that there are issues with error feedback mechanism, and there are theoretical issues and also practical issues. So I'll focus here on the theoretical issues. In order to guarantee that this method works, uh, papers that analyze error feedback assume all kinds of things, and many of them are really not reasonable. So for instance, most of the works assume that you work in a single node setup. So federated learning with a single edge device obviously doesn't make any sense, but uh, that's how the theory started in 2018. Or they assume that all the data is homogeneous, the same data on all the machines. So you now allow many machines, but they have the same data. Obviously, in federated learning, the data is very heterogeneous, so that is not reasonable. And there are some other unreasonable assumptions, which I will not go into. And even with these unreasonable and strong assumptions, the convergence rate, so the speed at which this converges to the true model is, is bad in a certain sense. So for instance, in strongly convex regime, whatever that means, uh, let's not go into this, uh, gradient descent would converge at a linear rate, which means the error would uh, uh, decay at exponentially, uh, exponentially fast, but error feedback does not. And for non-convex problems, uh, the rate that is obtained is one over t to the power of two thirds after t communication rounds, but gradient descent has, uh, has rate one over t, which is better than one over t to the power of two thirds. So there's clearly something that we don't understand about error feedback, and it's very fundamental. So here's just a brief summary of the papers that do theoretical analysis of error feedback and summary of why uh, there's issue with all of these analysis, one or another, either, either bad assumptions or strong assumptions or, or weak theory or both. But I will not go through this. Um, in, 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 in detail. So let me now go to the part which is actually the new contribution of the paper, which we're going to present in, in a few weeks at the NeurIPS uh, conference. Uh, let me talk about error feedback 21. So what is error feedback 21? Our proposal to fix distributed compressed gradients end, which is this method, right? You just average the compressed uh, gradients, and that's what you send to the server, is to run a method which looks almost identical. Okay, it doesn't look like error feedback. It looks almost identical, except these compressors, we will evolve in time. So we want to learn smarter and smarter compressors over time, which are better at better at compressing at the same rate as C, but they will be making less and less error throughout the uh, iterative process. So if you communicate once, maybe you make the same error as if you were running this method, but if you already communicate to five, three, five times, 10 times, 11 times, something like this, then this compressor is already much better at compressing this gradient than this fixed compressor. So that's really the idea. And how can we do it? Well, what we, we really want to happen is that the error that you make by compressing, so this is the distance between the compressed message and the true message that you want to uh, um, send, it should go to zero as the number of iteration grows. And if, if, if we can achieve it and it looks like wishful thinking, then we can, uh, we can fix the method. So the, there's two ideas how to do it that we came up with. And the first idea is this. It's based on the observation that if you knew that these gradients were converging to some limit, limit which we call V star, then we should compress using C. So this could be the top K or the random K compressor or low rung approximation or something like this. So this is not changing in time. We should not compress the gradient, which is the VT, but the difference between the VT and the limit of the V. Vt. Why? Because this difference will go to zero. And if you have a contractive compressor, then if the difference, uh, if, if the message that you want to compress, which would be now the difference of so the V would be the difference of these two vectors goes to zero, then the error goes to zero just because this norm goes to zero. So, so this is really the idea. And here's just a one line proof that this is the case. If we could run this compressor, then the error of this compressor, which evolves, clearly evolves in time, uh, would go to zero as the method converges. Uh, the problem, of course, with this method is that you don't know this limit. We don't know where these gradients will go. If we knew that, we could just implement this compressor and it would fix 
the method, and this would be the ideal error feedback mechanism. So in order to fix this uh, impracticality of this method, what we propose is that instead of V star, we use our best estimate of what we think V star is going to be. And this is the previous complex gradient. So CT minus one applied to VT minus one. So if we use this one, then, then the actual uh, compressor that we propose looks like this. So this is the definition of it. We send the previously sent message plus compressed difference between the current gradient and the previously sent message. Now, fortunately, we don't have to actually send this to the server, to the orchestrating server, because the server already knows it from the previous iterations. So we only need to send this compressed message and the server is able to reconstruct the CTVT just from that information. So this compressor has exactly the same properties as uh, the original compressor C in terms of its uh, compression capability, except it, it's much smarter because it evolves in time and in particular, the error will converge to zero as uh, the iteration counts increases. So this is the formal definition of this uh, compressor, which we call Markov compressor, because we don't define it as a function from RD to RD, from uh, the space of gradient to the space of gradients, but we define it as, as a Markov process. So this is an algorithm for learning a better compressor. And we need this algorithm in order to be compressing better and better. All right, so, so this is really our error feedback 21. It's just distributed compressed gradients and method with the only difference that we replace this static compressor C, which never evolves by this Markov compressor, which evolves in this way as shown here on the slide. And we, we can use a, a fixed step size or fixed learning rate and our method would work even without uh, learning rate uh, scheduling. Of course, it benefits from uh, scheduled learning rates. All right, so uh, how much time do I have at the moment? Um, we have only five minutes for questions, but you can go like briefly in one, two minutes. All right, so, so theory of error feedback 21. So we have first observation, and that is that if C has three properties, which actually the, the practically used Cs never have these three properties, uh, at least one of them fails, then error feedback 21 is the same as the original error feedback. So this allows us to actually use the name error feedback and nobody can accuse us that we just rename a, a known method. But it is a different method in practice because these, uh, these uh, conditions are not satisfied. And then we prove this main theorem which shows that the method works, okay? So I will not go into the details of what this really means, but this is a mathematical theorem which shows that the method works and not only it works, it works at this one over T, right? Because we have this constant divided by T and constant divided by T. So this improves on all the previous error feedback mechanisms. And in fact, this is the right rate. And from this, you can deduce the rate of gradient descent without any compression if you use compressors, which actually don't compress. So just set alpha, equals to uh, one, which actually means you have perfect contraction, which means you don't compress at all. And this is the standard theory for gradient descent. So this is the first theory of error feedback which generalizes gradient descent. So now I have just two slides of, on experiments. On this slide, I show that error feedback at some point stops working. You can see this with, the, with this orange line and this blue line right here. It just cannot learn much, much better. And on the X axis, I have bits communicated, but error feedback 21, and our more aggressive version, error feedback 21 plus, it continues uh, learning uh, beautifully. So it fixes uh, the, the practical performance and it's also theoretically better. And here we can com compare error feedback, error feedback 21 against the gradient descent, which is this light green line. And you can see that in terms of bits communicated, not, not compressing is, is hugely suboptimal. So, so this gradient descent just doesn't work at all. And all of these error feedback methods, they work. And our air feedback 21 method works much better than the original air feedback method. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. In fact, uh, as expected, uh, ahead of time uh, presentation and uh, research. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are already uh, out of time, but I had many questions on the gradient descent. And in fact, more about the the cold start on, on, on this and how we can uh, converge fast. Uh, like I know, for instance, in, in, in Python maybe and in other uh, open source frameworks, they run several rounds in, uh, in the server before sending uh, the, the weight uh, to, the, to the clients. Um, uh, I had also question about the number of clients and number of uh, rounds between the server and the 
the, the, the local learning. Um, I don't know if, if you can uh, discuss in one minute about the cold start. Yes, I can. I, can, I, can I, I will comment on, on the later question that you had, because that is more relevant to my talk. And that is about the number of rounds. So the number of rounds is exactly what our theorem was bounding. So our theorem says that, that the number of rounds is something like one over epsilon, where epsilon is the accuracy of the model that you want to achieve. So yeah. some constant divided by epsilon. So that is the number of rounds. And this is better theory than the previous error feedback. Now, uh, if you want to do partial participation, yes, we can do it. We didn't do this in this paper, but we have even newer paper, which is already on archive, where we also uh, do error feedback 21 with partial participation. We also can do it with uh, subsampling on each uh, node. So not full gradient, but stochastic gradient. We can reduce variance of it. We can add momentum and so on and so forth. So we have six practical and theoretical enhancements of error feedback 21 in this new paper. In terms of cold start, that is completely orthogonal question. It's a very interesting one. But uh, this work that we've done does not touch on the topic at all. I have opinion on it, but I don't have time to talk about it. Well, absolutely state of art uh, uh, discussion and findings. Thank you for this uh, ahead of thank time. Uh, Peter, it was an honor for hosting you today. Uh, thank you once more. My pleasure. So now we will move on in our schedule and our next speaker is uh, Aaron. Uh, Aaron uh, is the CEO and creator founder of Riot Secure um, in Sweden. He will uh, tell us more about the internet of disconnected uh, things. So it will address like the, the security concerns in, in this uh, large scale decentralized um, architecture. So uh, Aaron, thank you for uh, accepting our invitation. Uh, you have the uh, floor and mic. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I should be good. I think we're good. Yes. Oh. yes. You can see the you can see the screen. Confirmed. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, um, it's very interesting actually because I'm not the university type. I'm more the realistic, get down to earth and make things happen type. So it's definitely been interesting seeing these presentations. Um, I had a comment in the in the in, in regards to the last presentation, but the you kind of answered my questions and my concerns. So it wasn't really relevant in the end. But I think the key thing here is you know, Riot Secure is a uh, it's a small company based in Stockholm, and our focus is actually to identify uh, security concerns, uh, and but more importantly, provide a, a solution to security for the Internet of Things. Uh, while our talk is not specifically related to federated learning, uh, it has become more of a concern because over time, as we've let me just get our mouse in the right position, there we go. Oh, yeah, my mouse not working. There we go. So over time. Um, we've seen like, you know, there's been a trend, there's going to be 50 billion plus devices. I mean, it depends on who you ask, but we're seeing devices pop up everywhere. It's smart cities, uh, you're seeing industrial IoT, you're seeing mobile, mobile environments, smart homes, uh, everywhere. And I mean, this all, this is all coming to be a big concern. And I think the, the, the critical thing we're worried about here is, you know, what are the real concerns? I mean, I have a nasty I guess it's what you say, it's a shock, shock timeline. It should kind of wake people up to say, should we really be concerned about security and IoT? And I guess the key thing for us is we propose a solution that I think uh, would solve this problem, uh, but it does, it's very important that even while we're doing these excellent research uh, opportunities with federated learning and moving AI to the edge, one thing that's critical with IoT is definitely to think about lifecycle management. Uh, and actually how you can securely, not only securely communicate uh, information to the cloud, that's, that's, not, that's not really an issue, but more importantly, how you can identify routes of trust uh, and actually securely work with firmware updates. And when it comes to uh, federated learning, more importantly, model updates. So just to get started, IoT has been around for years. So originally it was called N2M, uh, but the first real panic when it comes to IoT was back in 2010. Uh, and this is when, this is the, the hack called Stuxnet. And this is basically where the Israeli and US Secret Service were implicated uh, to actually have hacked the Iran's nuclear programs, program logical controllers that were responsible for the uh, uranium enrichment centrifuges. Uh, basically what they did is they hacked it. So they caused them to spin out of control. And of course, this is the first time that it was actually become 
a security risk becomes a real physical risk because you, who knows what could have happened if this went bad, uh, especially dealing with nuclear. Moving forward with 2013, we've seen uh, the internet uh, security cameras by Foxcam get hacked by some researchers, Sergey and Artem. Uh, and what they actually did is they hacked a uh, little girl's um, webcam and started screaming at her uh, through the microphone, right? So this is not something the, the parents expected, uh, but this was all coming through as the exposed, as the IoT devices were pushed out and become more popular. Uh, even more concerning was in 2015 when the, um, the Jeep uh, cars, which use the Harman Kardon New Connect system, uh, which is actually an infotainment center so you can play music and so forth, uh, was connected to and hacked by a mobile phone connection. Uh, and for some reason, the infotainment set, some center had access to the CAN bus network. Uh, and what happened was a wired uh, reporter actually had a live demonstration of him driving down a freeway with Charlie and Chris remotely hacking their Jeep. And actually the picture there is when the end result, when they actually drove the car into the ditch uh, and basically the driver had no, no control over, over this at all. So this was an, another major concern that, had, that came up. Probably the, everyone's heard about this one, the Marais botnet uh, that, that originally surfaced in 2016. And what basically happened here was it was targeting uh, mainly IP cameras and routers, uh, basically exploiting default passwords. Like everyone knows you've got admin, admin, admin password. When you buy a router, it's the first kind of, kind of password you have. And people were just basically putting these devices out there without changing it. And what happened is someone wrote a little small botnet that would actually um, scan the network and look and try and attempt to access the telnet or SSH ports using the default credentials and effectively set up a botnet uh, that one day was actually tested and uh, put to use uh, by having a, a distributed denial of service on the, the domain provider Dyn. Uh, which effectively took down a, a number of websites for a few hours, right? So it's kind of like a, whoa, this is now getting out of control. Uh, more importantly, getting closer to the more physical harm, uh, in 2019, the St. Jude Medical Pacemaker, which used RF communications, uh, was easily hacked. Uh, if you were within, within 15 meters or uh, you know, a small distance to a person who had a pacemaker, you could have actually turned it off just by you know, using an RF command. So what happened here was, of course, there was a recall of 500,000 devices, but you can understand it's kind of dangerous to take that, the pacemaker out of the humans. Uh, so it was a bit of a panic to actually organize everyone who had these pacemakers to make a patient visit to their medical professional to actually get a firmware update. Uh, 2019, we saw Devil's ID, uh, which was basically a remote code execution with the Stack Overflow vulnerability on the library GSOAP. Uh, that was utilized within the OnViv protocol, which is the, the video feed protocol. Uh, and a lot of providers were affected by this, but probably the worst of all was access communications, uh, where 249 of the 252 cameras they had were impacted. And the three that were not were actually very, or very old and ancient. So they didn't have the, this library at all. But you can see how important this kind of spans. And more importantly, just last week, we saw uh, Botanago, uh, which is basically a malware written in Golang uh, that utilized uh, over 30 known exploits uh, to establish itself as attack vectors that actually was being put in place as it's assumed that it's going to be there to complement the Marais botnet uh, to actually, you know, eventually do some more damage in the future. And what actually happened from all this is, you know, Rob Tiffany, who's the VP and IoT entrepreneur at Ericsson, uh, he had a blog post a couple of weeks ago that basically said, we've inadvertently created the largest attack surface in the history of computing. Uh, basically, all these devices, they're not behind the traditional walls or fortresses that we've had in the past, like behind firewalls or DMZs. These devices are all out there directly on the internet. They've got default usernames and passwords. They don't have encryption. They don't have a lot of things. And they're out there getting hacked and effectively turning into zombies. So... This was kind of like a, a very bold statement to have uh, coming forward from someone you know, at such a position with Ericsson. Now, talking about security risk, I mean, typically the biggest, biggest ones that happen are typically zero day vulnerabilities. And in a, in a perfect world, and I hate to say this, in a real perfect world, typically a researcher, I wouldn't say hacker, we say a researcher 
discovers a vulnerability, that vulnerability is then disclosed to the vendor. Uh, the vendor then works on a fix, and of course, the vendor then releases a fix. Uh, the problem with this, especially with regards to IoT, since everyone's been trying to get devices out there, uh, or they don't have some form of lifecycle management, the vendor working on the fix or the vendor releasing a fix uh, may actually never happen. So what happens is these devices have a permanent window of vulnerability. Uh, and you can easily see yourself, you know, if you've got an IP camera at home, if you were to ask a, a survey of a thousand, um, you know, normal people who own an IP camera, if they knew how to access the IP address of their camera and how to log in and upload a firmware update, you'll find that, you know, one out of a thousand would know how to do this, right? So basically, once these devices are on the market, they're forever, you know, vulnerable to, you know, being, being attacked by, by, by hackers or you know, people who are in dark nature. So effectively, we, we bring up the concept of you know, the internet of insecure things. And this is a classic joke uh, that I've had as a background for my, my desktop for many years. And the, the guy obviously saying, do you know the S in IoT is for security? And the player is saying, but there's no S in IoT. And that's exactly the concern. Now, why is this the case? And I mean, you know, I mean, we see a lot of, I see a lot of people doing uh, research and so forth. Uh, that basically, you know, they don't really think about, you know, security because they think it's kind of someone else's problem. Uh, but the reality is, you know, IoT hardware in reality, it's not supercomputers. They're not Linux, uh, typically, uh, but they're typically microcontrollers. Uh, and, you know, looking at the, the span of uh, IoT devices out there right now, 80% of these devices most likely use resource-constrained microcontrollers. Uh, you don't have gigahertz or megabytes of memory or flash, uh, you have very little, like you're talking, you know, some, some cases you're dealing with, you know, 48 megahertz CPUs with, you know, 32K of RAM. Uh, and unfortunately the market is severely fragmented. There's a lot of providers. You've got Nordic, MIP, BIPs, uh, you've got ARM, you've got Texas Instruments. And a lot of this software needs to be written in very, very low languages such as C and C++ or low level assembly to actually get something out of them. But when it comes to IoT, it's actually, it comes down to a number of things. I mean, the way we see it, the easy part is the thing, all right? So when it comes to what you guys are working on, when you talk about federated learning and so forth, this is really your code on the edge, right? So you have a microcontroller or you have some form of environment that you're working with. You're gonna read sensors, you're gonna control actu actuators, you're gonna analyze and process data. And then basically do some logic, you're gonna basically say, look, what do I do with it? And either you're gonna send data or you're gonna do something with it locally. But the hard part of IoT is actually the I, right? So we talked about the S being security, but the I is actually the internet. So the challenges here is, you know, how do we set up network communication? How do we do security and privacy? How do we establish the root of trust? How do we deal with robustness and stability, data protection, but more importantly, how do we deal with lifecycle management? So it's not about just you know, throwing your code out there. There's a lot more to it. And if you look at a recent survey uh, from Eclipse, uh, looking at the top developer concerns, nothing here is really about you know, how I'm gonna work with IoT in terms of doing what you wanna do, like federated learning or so forth. Everyone's concerned about security, connectivity, uh, privacy, you know, standards or lack of them. Uh, and more importantly, looking at the operating systems that are out there, uh, while this doesn't add up to 100%, I think the, the survey was quite interesting the way they did this. They, they basically said, you know, on the edge and on routers, this is kind of the distribution of operating systems. Uh, we see that, you know, looking at this, there's a large majority of, of operating systems that are not really traditional IoT operating systems, right? You've got Linux and Windows, uh, which are more traditionally desktop or server-based uh, operating systems. But then you have that small subset of uh, RTOS, such as free RTOS and Zephyr. And of course, you also have the, the non-OS environments. Now, what does this mean for us though? Well, basically it comes down to an attack surface, right? So basically what we have out there right now is that anyone who uses or deploys a IoT device really needs to address what is my attack surface and what is the way in for a hacker? To, to take advantage. Now, when you're using environments uh, that are based on Linux or Windows, uh, by, by the outset, even if you were to harden your Linux environment to a, the maximum level, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to have the backgrounds on what the, 
top, I guess you could say the top seven um, IoT nightmares have been in the last years. It's not about, sometimes it's about default usernames and passwords, but it's also about zero day vulnerabilities. For example, the GSOAP vulnerability, while it wasn't known at deployment, it was something that came uh, out, out of a zero day availability. And of course, then, then it was capitalized on by hackers. So the challenge here when it comes to IoT is how is your best solution to actually reduce your attack surface? So, I mean, if you can get rid of your attack surface, then you're basically in a best position. And what does this mean overall is that IoT development is actually quite hard, right? So, I mean, it's very easy for you to connect a few sensors and and use some open source library and say, oh, look, I'm connecting in there. I'll just push my temperature to the cloud. Uh, but when you start dealing with, you know, the security and connectivity of, of everything, then you start questioning, you know, am I, am I a data scientist or am I a internet security expert who knows how to write C and C++ and knows the inner, inner workings of the TCP IP protocol and, you know, what the hackers are doing on, you know, in terms of looking at port level or set assignments and so forth. So this brings us to the concept that we've introduced. Uh, we, we had a white paper recently, uh, which is the concept of the internet of disconnected things, which is kind of, you know, if you look at it, you say, well, isn't that kind of the opposite of the internet of things? Uh, and basically the theory here is yes and no, because our strategy is to say, well, we want the thing to be connected, but we don't want, want anyone to actually theoretically connect to it, right? Because if you don't expose any form of attack service to your IoT devices, then theoretically, you know, the device itself can't be hacked, unless of course you have physical access, but everyone knows physical access is no, is no, you know, there's no, there's no, no prevention around it unless you've got hardware level protection. But basically, if your device is not really connected, uh, then that's probably the most secure approach. Now, the question is, you know, well, people say, well, how do I do this? How do I, you know, put my federated learning or my my my, uh, my logic on a microcontroller and actually still be disconnected because someone needs to write this? So we introduced the concept of the separation of concerns. So what we want to basically do is to say, you know, let's move the fun stuff, which I would say is, you know, doing your tiny ML and everything else uh, into one little packet. Uh, and completely separated uh, from the communications and security. Uh, but then if you want to use that communication security, you have to use some form of bridge. Uh, so you basically can say here that the, 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 the yellow shaded area will be the networking, the blue would be the bridge, and the purple would be the, the fun stuff, right? Which would actually be your thing. So looking at that in theory, you know, you've got your thing with your sensors and actuators, and you can do whatever you want there. Right, and then secondarily, you have your um, network environment, uh, and then you have your bridge. Now, the great thing with this is that bridge not only provides you some form of virtual network, but it also gives the ability for that microcontroller, which is responsible for networking, to actually completely reprogram the microcontroller, which is focusing on the thing. And the benefit of this is you get isolation and security. Right, so the great thing here is that you know you can do whatever you want. You can actually write the most insecure thing, and as long as you use this distribution environment where you have the separation of concerns, the attacker from the outside can only focus their effort on the network device. But since that device isn't running a device or isn't running an operating system that's exposing ports or uh, providing services that are connectable, and since it's a client-driven you know, the device needs to communicate to the cloud to establish connections. There's no way in for a hacker uh, to compromise that device. Of course, they can compromise, they can, they can simulate packets and, you know, um, you know, masquerade as a device, but this is talking about device side and edge level security. So the benefits of this, so, you know, what does it really come down to? And it comes down to the fact that, you know, you don't have to be a security expert or a resource constrained developer. So, you know, you look at a lot of IoT jobs, they talk about, you know, you need to do security, you need to know C and C++. So what this paradigm or this concept gives you is actually freedom of choice because you run your thing isolated on your own, right? You're in your own little microcontroller, right? You do your little business. And when you want to send and receive data, you just send a message over the VPN tunnel. Uh, you can have the freedom to choose whatever microcontroller you want. 
you're not saying, oh, you, use, you need to use arm because if you use arm, you need to use pelion or, uh, you know, being tied down a certain way. There are many microcontrollers out there uh, that are well adapted uh, for doing different purposes, right? So you should choose the appropriate microcontroller for the task at hand. You've got the freedom to use whatever operating system you want, freedom to use whatever programming language. You know, people will say, oh, we're using a scripting language. You know, that's not secure. When you're isolated, you can do whatever you want. Use your own runtime environment, and more importantly, your own libraries and frameworks. Now, I could go on and on about this, but I think, you know, this may sound very theoretical to you, but actually we have a use case. Uh, I know you guys probably, probably not the last two years, but I'm sure you've been traveling by air and you visited an airport at some point. Uh, what we've actually done, we've, we've got a project with SAS, which is Scandinavian Airlines in Stockholm, Arlanda. And we've built them an industrial IoT solution. And as you can see in that photograph, we've got one little microcontroller, which is in the, the left hand of the presenter there, which is the MKR GSM. That is a microcontroller that focuses on communication to the internet. And on the other side, we've got a dedicated industrialized IoT board that has relays, sensors, uh, and additional microcontrollers that can read, read things, do logic locally, geofencing, et cetera. Uh, that is completely isolated from the network. Uh, and the great thing with us is that we can just swap that GSM for a Wi-Fi or an MBIOT. But, you know, we've taken that principle of the disconnected concept and actually done it in reality. So now, maybe, Aaron, you can uh, sum up with in one minute. That is basically it, right? So <laughs> basically, uh, that was the, uh, I just wanted to show you the concept and, um, you know, the principle of this is, I mean, it's, uh, well, it's not, related to a lot of the theory you guys are working on, it's just important to understand that security is not about just communication, right? Communication, you know, these days, most of the modems that are out there can reliably do a HTTPS connection. It wasn't the same 15 years ago, 10 years ago, but it does come down to the, the question, you know, how do you do device enrollment? How do you do trust? How, you, how do you do firmware updates over the air? Uh, and more importantly, how do you protect, you know, what is, what is, what is your solution from hackers, right? So, uh, I mean, this is a, to us, we saw it as a, a revolutionary idea uh, that basically says, stop, stop your IoT devices being servers. Uh, and that's basically the, the bottom line. So I'm happy to answer any questions, if there are any. Yes, actually we do. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting uh, topic. That it's, it addresses exactly the point of your presentation about the uh, trustability and the, the, the secure of this uh, internet of things or internet of disconnected um, uh, things. Um, in fact, Ahmed have a question, but before that, uh, since a lot of uh, new paradigms like uh, virtual sensor uh, layers, um, uh, besides end-to-end -end encryption, uh, maybe also adding a, a blockchain uh, layer to secure uh, the, the, the communication, especially with the full decentralized um, edge intelligence devices. So my question would be regarding the counter attack. So you, you explained that the attack surface very clearly, you demonstrate some use cases, but what are our tool to enable the edge intelligence? The, the wave is coming. How, what, what is our counter? I mean, I think that this, the, the only way to really be secure is to stop exposing services. And I think, you know, you need to design your solutions uh, that are, you know, any, any form of communication has to come from the device itself. You can't, you shouldn't reach out to the device. The, the device should reach to the cloud. Now, talking about, you know, layers of security, you can, you can implement blockchain to enforce, you know, the fact that, firmware updates occur after each other, right? There's ways, there's so many things you can do. And the great thing with, by doing the isolation, you have a lot of concepts you can do. I mean, when it comes to security, the, the security itself should be done by that little security microcontroller. And what they do is really something that could eventually be standardized and you know, uh, set, set as like, this is the default way to go. But the benefit of this is that people who develop IoT things should not have to worry about it. They should focus on what are my machine learning models? What do I need to gather? What do I need to get? And focus on those things and be the data scientist rather than security expert. And the, the whole idea of what we're trying to push is to say, you know, we, we're offering a platform where you can actually 
build your solutions and not have to worry about security. You say, I'm going to send some data. I'm going to receive some data. And I know it's going to get there and come back securely. And I know that no one's going to, phys- going to actually have any form of access to, to my microcontroller and my yes. environment. So it's really a paradigm shift to say, you know, stop trying to be the IoT developer as a whole. You, you need to separate the concept. And the, and the better you, you separate it, uh, the more modular it will be. I mean, yeah. having the networking by itself, that same networking code could work for everyone and then everyone can do whatever they want in their own microcontrollers. Very, very informative. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Uh, let me just uh, also add that um, uh, security by design is very important concept, like, like adding security in the early stages of, of the design, not adding security layers to your already designed uh, system. Yes. And yes, there but- where uh, federative learning uh, nobility came from, it has been built in privacy preserving by design uh, concept and we also move from privacy by design into privacy by default pattern by adding more uh, secure layers to this system so thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation and for so, uh, a very informative talk i would say that wasn't wasn't directly related to the federated learning but i think that the principle is important because it, you're right it's not about putting band-aids on security it's about saying design it security by design uh you know keep it simple uh, and, you know, if we take that approach and we demonstrate that we've got a real customer that uses our system and I can guarantee yes. no one's going to hack those devices. But so we have also a couple of questions in the, in the chat. You can, yeah, uh, I can follow uh, up reflect on them. Uh, thank you once more. And now, uh, without uh, further ado, uh, we have our last uh, speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Isam Mansour is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science uh, and Software Engineering at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. So good morning uh, for you. It's early morning uh, there. Uh, so Sam is uh, the head uh, of Concordia Data Systems uh, Lab and his uh, research uh, is focusing on developing uh, cognitive data science platforms for federated and big data sets. Uh, so uh, yes, we can see your uh, slides and we can hear you clearly. So floor and Mike with you, thank you. You can start. Hi. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Good yeah, time. perfect. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. I actually going to speak about uh, some of the work we are doing in our lab, uh, focusing on data discovery platform empowered by knowledge graph. Actually, before I start, I would like to give a brief of about what we are doing. We are actually trying to build there is right now in uh, in data science platforms there is a gap for better improvement. Uh, where we have this data science platform is focusing more on uh, some aspects, which is the main uh, bulk of how to do data science pipelines. Uh, we find the challenges related to different aspects. Uh, some of them related to data preparation. So this is actually very time consuming. And when we say that. Um, the difference here, when you deal with machine learning by blind, most of this machine learning by blind is starting with very well-defined data sets. You find in Kaggle a lot of, you know, uh, ready annotated data sets that you can start with directly uh, for your, uh, you know, practicing or writing a machine learning by blind. But when it comes for, uh, for data science, it is not the case. And the, the, the thing that it is not the case, not because we, ha- we are running uh, uh, out of, uh, of data, but actually it is not the case because we are, we are facing a huge amount of data. So right now, uh, the problem is not about finding data, about you know, finding enough data, but finding the relevant data. Um, this is just an example of available data portals. Uh, today, you can access these portals for free. And it has very variable information related to different topics, you know. But the thing is that, how can we uh, find relevant data to a task under, you know, investigation? Uh, these data portals they provide very limited, you know, uh, uh, tools uh, to search these data sets. Usually, you can search metadata, you know, provided related to the, to the available data sets. And sometimes you can also filter using a, a kind of some format. But when it comes to data enrichment, if you are working 
in a data science pipeline and you do you you have to enrich your data set it is not only about searching metadata of data sets um maybe i have ended within my data science pipeline with a certain data frame and this data frame doesn't have enough you know uh, cases uh, this is why maybe the model is is failing in categorizing certain you know uh, uh, cases and we need more data sets so i just would like to start from that data frame and finding directly uh, similar data sets so this kind of data portals will not allow me to do that there is a, a huge amount of work that should done you know uh, manually by a data scientist to load to download data sets and then load it somewhere in a data system searching these data sets in order to find similarity with that data frame they had in the pipeline and this is now another example here that is showing the availability of data sets uh, in uh, you know in uh, in different data portals uh, at the level of you know uh, states or countries we have thousands of data sets uh, Kaggle alone, they have a thousand of data sets and hundred thousand of uh, machine learning pipelines applied to it. So the thing that, again, it is uh, a problem that we are facing right now when it comes to open data uh, portals or even at the level of an enterprise. We have a project with uh, Borealis AI. This is an, a data science lab working for one of the largest banks in, in Canada. Uh, they have, you know, uh, different branches over Canada with 20 terabytes of data. And the thing that their data science is really consuming too much time looking for data. Um, so our idea actually is to utilize knowledge graph ontologies in order to create a global schema for what we call it a data leak. So we can actually uh have that knowledge graph uh, as a global schema you can search to find relevant data sets how this is different from existing research there is some work actually uh, when it comes to data lake about organizing metadata like i'm now speaking from the most uh left uh this is two systems like organizations this one system has, was published in sigma 2020 and i but the thing that these systems assuming one single thing, which is that users will provide metadata about their data sets. And this is a very time consuming process to assume with huge amount of data I was showing you now, this is you know based on real figures. Someone is going to provide metadata about these data sets, which is in thousands. So although these systems are really good, but at the end of the day, that limitation is going to limit the use of these uh, systems. Uh, there is also some work uh, actually in converting relational database into RDF. So at the end of the day, uh, knowledge graph could be represented as, uh, you know, uh, as an RDF graph or probability graph. And the objective in our work is not to touch and convert the raw data into another form. Uh, we would like to keep raw data as it is, okay? But we would like to maintain that knowledge graph in order to be able to discover, uh, you know, uh, similar data sets uh, efficiently. And this is how we are different from this work. And there is some other work which is actually saying, okay, nowadays we have a lot of knowledge graphs. As these knowledge graphs like uh, DBpedia, Wikidata, and a lot of you know uh, very good examples of uh, knowledge graphs, and uh, we can extract a tabular form of data from these knowledge graphs. So it is now converting. It is the opposite of the previous uh, category, where we are converting data from the form of RDF graph to you know. Uh, a tabular form like relational table again this is this is not what we are solving and the most close to what we are doing is actually uh, systems in data discovery uh, like arum or d3l 
uh, where these systems okay they are not relying on uh, you know uh, metadata but they are trying to profile do data profiling and based on this profiling they try to build a graph uh, these uh, graphs are uh, like is not like in the form of rdf graphs meaning it is not going to be accessed or managed by uh, any systems it's just managed by these systems because it is you know uh, following certain in memory uh, format and uh, one thing also these systems they didn't rely on uh, querying data based on embeddings which actually we something we are doing is to try to get uh, you know representation learning of columns and tables uh, converting this representation learning into uh, in a form of uh, embeddings and then based on these embeddings we can search the data so uh, this is actually how we are different from existing work and this is what we we are actually ending with uh, so at the end of the day as you see that from the uh, bottom left uh, you know we have what we call it a data lake this could be your you know uh, your uh, uh, local storage where you have a set of files uh, csv files json or even uh, the, con the database that you can connect to uh, you know before i was working in a project related uh, to merck and uh, this is one uh, big uh, pharma company they have like 4000 oracle databases in their company and it is very time consuming for data scientists there in order to do data preparation. Because the thing that we don't know what relevant data were related to the task I'm investigating. So we are inventing, you know, or developing um, uh, a knowledge graph and uh, embeddings for this data available in the, in, in the data lake. Uh, through data profiling and based on this profiling, then we can uh, do as a graph builder and again this data is is growing yeah uh, most of data portals and most of uh, organization enterprises usually this set of data is growing so we are assuming uh, incremental you know construction of the graph and we do that actually by uh, assuming only the delta uh, new data and for this delta new data we create a subgraph and then uh, we try to connect the new subgraph to the original one. At the end of the day, we end with a storage where we have uh, a knowledge graph representing, you know, uh, connections between available data sets. Then we, we have the orange part, which is okay. Now you have this, you know, uh, global schema uh, of the existing uh data sets in accessible to us so in that sense uh, we can do a discovery of data so if you are a data scientist looking for example you would like to analyze you know salary bias you know uh, in it section uh, it sector uh, so in that sense you you can you can know exactly what you are looking for but you don't know where so you are looking for information where you have employee employees names and salaries and gender you know uh, so in that sense you can instead of this dotted line between your uh, machine learning by, by blinds platform and the data lake directly where you are assuming a data scientist uh, need to be aware where exactly the data you can actually use our kg lab to do uh, data discovery operations. I'm going to speak more about what kind of discovery operations we can enable. And then all these uh, discovery operations for us will be converted into a Sparkle query because you are querying a knowledge graph. And with that said, we can also provide another kind of queries, which is uh, going to help a lot, in, especially in enterprise, which is actually querying based on embedding. Going back to the example I mentioned about that data frame I end with within my, my, my pipeline. Now I would like to query the enterprise data to find if I have similar data sets I can use. In enterprises, it is 
it is a challenging part because you cannot just uh, query like in Merck, you cannot just directly query these 4,000 Oracle databases because for a simple reason, maybe you do not have permission to access this data. In banking, like when we are working with Borealis, as you have huge amount of data sets, but it is not accessible to everyone. And because you don't know there is actually data related to your uh, task under investigation, you cannot request actually uh, access permission to this data. But through our system, we can do that because you, we can get embeddings representing uh, after you know doing learning, uh, uh, representation learning for uh, this data frame, we end with embeddings representing this data frame, and then we can compare it with you know the embeddings we generated to the data to the data lake, and then based on the similarity, we can indicate that you know what there is some data items related to this data frame you are uh, you, you are trying to enrich. Now, this is another level. Now, once the system indicating there is similar data sets, we didn't yet give you access to the data. And remember what I mentioned in the comparison between us and uh, converting RDF uh, relation database to RDF. In KG lag, we are not keeping the raw data. We are only keeping this global schema, which is the knowledge graph connecting data sets and the embeddings which is actually representation learning of the, the raw data itself. So once you do that, we can actually uh, have here this kind of access control, you know? So uh, in order to access, you would like to fetch the, the raw data belongs to a certain column or belongs to a certain table. Now you go through the access control in order now not to access the raw data from KGLAC, but from the data lake itself. And this is an overview of, uh, of that system. This is, for example, uh, you know, the schema that you can imagine will be uh, created after profiling, you know, uh, data sets. So we will end with, in, in that, uh, in our, you know, knowledge graph, you have different type of nodes. As indicated here, uh, we have nodes representing data sets where a data set is just a bunch or a set of files. And then this, this files at the end of the day here, we are dealing with, you know, uh, files for us could be, you know, CSV files or JSON documents, but we refer to these files as a, a category of uh, tables and then Within these tables, we also have another level, which is columns. Because in data science by blinds, uh, we access, you know, uh, at these different levels. We access uh, data sets, tables, and columns. And even for unstructured data sets, if a, mach a machine learning by blind is starting with unstructured data sets, based on our observations, we end after a while, you know, extracting, you know, in information from this unstructured data ending to structured data. This is why we focus more on uh, structured data sets. And as you see that we are supporting different types based on our uh, data profiling, uh, we are supporting different types of relationship. So we can detect that uh, there is, uh, you know, a semantic similarity uh, between uh, two columns like, uh, you know, uh, total bay and uh, uh, Conversation, you know, so there is a kind of semantic similarity here. We are using here word embedding in order to detect, uh, you know, similarities at the schema level. And there is also content similarity, you know, as we see here. And our content similarity is based on our deep learning models to uh, do kind of uh, representation learning bare column. So we generate embeddings bare columns and then based on the distance between these embeddings, we can decide based on a threshold whether we consider this as a link uh, in our graph or no. And uh, again, as we focus uh, more in uh, structured data, we are uh, interested to detect some uh, kind of relationships like primary key, foreign key, which is important in, you know, in enriching data sets with more accurate data.
So uh, in terms of uh, discovery operations, uh, the good thing here, you can, we are providing a set, a preset, a, a, pre, a predefined set of uh, uh, discovery operations like finding, you know, or querying data sets in terms of uh, table names. Uh, let's have examples here. You know, like you'd like to get uh, all tables with a certain keyword um, and you would like to get uh, columns with a certain, uh, you know, uh, 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 column name. And here also we can search uh, using, you know, uh, semantic similarity uh, or searching, you know, the recovered relationships actually uh, in your uh, graph. And one interesting thing here, which is actually usually it is a time consuming thing when it comes to uh, data enrichment, uh, usually it is about enriching, you know, a certain uh, table with more data. So in that, uh, you don't need to really uh, do any effort more than just using our function of, um, of uh, shortest path. You know, I will give that example later. Yeah, like this one, short path between columns. So if you'd like to join between two tables, actually you can use a short path. So you can, you would like with a very minimal number of hubs, you can join and enrich your data. One thing also uh, we provide in our, uh, you know, system. This is at the end of the day is an RDF graph, which is representing the schema of data available in your data lake. So if one of these, uh, if, if one of these is not uh, supported, uh, one of the queries you have in mind is not supported, you can write directly a Sparkle query. So this is now how, how it, it works. You know, uh, one of the things we are providing, we are, we are providing actually uh, a KG, uh, KG lac uh, you know, library. Uh, you can actually use it with your Jupyter notebook or with your machine learning uh, platform in order to communicate with our system. So you actually establish the connection with the system. And then as you see here, you will find, you know, a KG lac uh, operator. So here, I, for example, I'm searching table with name employee underscore info dot CSV. Now this operator will, will be looking for data sets in general in the entire data lake. And again, this data lake could be, you know, coming from, uh, you know, structured data uh, like uh, Oracle or, you know, just CSV files. In that sense, you would like to only to look for these. And, and sorry. So this is just here an example. That the thing that I would like to emphasize, the thing that I would like to emphasize here is that at the end of the day, you know, uh, uh, you are getting from the system back uh, a data frame. So you can filter the data frame the way you like, and this is how it works. As I mentioned before, we are supporting two, diff uh, two different types of, uh, you know, embeddings. Uh, this embedding could be at the schema level, and uh, it could be, this is based on word embedding, and it could be uh, at the content level. And for that, we are using our own uh, deep learning uh, techniques to generate the embeddings. And we have now, out of that, we have a lot of challenges. Uh, a challenge of integrity uh, constraints as a, uh, inference rules, you know. Again, this integrity constraints has been studied uh, very well in relation database, but now can we enable this in integrity constraints on top of our graph? Uh, meaning you end with a graph that is over time, uh, you know, detecting more and more relationships automatically, you know? Uh, this is something, you know, uh, we can enable on top, we are investigating to enable it on top of our, uh, you know, uh, kg lag graph. And, uh, also, the maintenance of this graph should be like uh, synchronization because this graph is not with the static data. This data is, is, is changing and we need to have an incremental way of, you know, uh, creating this graph. And uh, data exploration on top of the graph. And here now it comes to be more interesting. 
For example, in our work with uh, Borealis AI, this data science lab, they are not they do not have one single branch. I mean, this is this graph of KG lack is going to be maintained as a as geo distributed graph. So in that sense, it is very interesting as we see here in this working with this graph in a federated settings. You know, uh, this is this is actually is like uh, going to face some of the challenges for uh, federated learning, but at the level of at the level of this you know geo distributed graphs. For example, that when we have the embeddings and comparing them locally. Now we need to think about uh, features that is going to be maintained in, in the local graph and how we can uh, end with a global features uh, that could be used at the federated settings. And to summarize, this is uh, how uh, KGLAC looks like. You know, it is, uh, in, in, this is a technology we are using for, for now, Spark, and this is allowing us to scale in terms of data profiling, uh, so we can use uh, more resources as needed. Uh, we are, for now, we are storing our embeddings in Elasticsearch and the graph. Uh, we are using Virtuoso to store the graph. And um, on one thing, most of the you know, automatic learning we are enabling on top of our graph is relying on graph neural network. And this is showing very good, you know, uh, results so far. Um, reusability, it is a very simple, you know, interface between uh, the system and existing machine learning uh, platforms, which is you use our library. At the end of the day, you query and you get a, a data frame back. So with the data frame, you can do whatever you, you want in the rest of the pipeline. We are, this is, this is one way we were focusing on. And the other way uh, also is providing, you know, going back to that category where this category relying on metadata like Amundsen. Amundsen is a well-known tool used with, you know, uh, data science uh, uh, platforms like Databricks, but they do not have any way to maintain metadata. Now we are integrating our system with Amundsen to automate the generation of metadata. So all the information we can create regarding the schema and how they are connected could be maintained automatically. So we don't need a user to fill this information. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sincerely, uh, uh, Victoria. So I'm, actually, we are almost uh, in time uh, for this. Maybe we have uh, enough time for uh, one uh, final question uh, uh, on this. Like uh, I had many questions uh, before on uh, using uh, GNN graph neural networks, especially in, in federated learning on clustering and in, you know, in grouping uh, of uh, the edge client. But um, I will uh, focus maybe on, on the chat in the questions in the chat. Uh, I have two questions from uh, Muhammad Ragab and from Ahmed. So uh, uh, Muhammad says, uh, how do you assess in terms of metric, the relevance of uh, adat science in let's say uh, a data lake? Um, Muhammad, can you speak up and uh, say your question if you can? Hello, Sam. Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, actually, my question was like, how do you assess in terms of metrics the re relevance of a data set in the data lake? Data lake? Uh, I mean, so, how do you, mm -hmm, please. So your question is about how to decide uh, these two, this, uh, two data items are similar or not? No, no. Uh, if, if I have like two data sets in the, uh, uh, in, in the data lake, which one yes. I assess like is this is more relevant to my like integration for example, or enriching my data set in, in my hand? Yeah, at the end of the day, we have like two uh, metrics here. One is relying on uh, exact matching with the keywords you have in your data set. This is what we call it a schema matching. Uh, and we do the schema matching using exact matching or semantic, sem uh, semantic similarity. You know, okay. by getting the embeddings, uh, the word embeddings for, uh, for example, the column name here, and the word embedding for the column name in the other one. And then we uh, decide the similarity or based on the content similarity. And okay. this content similarity based on the embedding we are generating to the actual content. 
so one <laughs> last question, uh, maybe Sam, is um, how do you see the future of uh, graph neural networks in the uh, general distributed uh, machine learning uh, realm? Um, sorry, uh, maybe please read again. Yes, uh, I was wondering about um, the future uh, of uh, graph neural networks in the distributed machine learning. To be honest, I think this is uh, going to have a lot of work in terms of uh, distributed system development. Uh, because when we think about it, um, you know, graph neural network relying heavily on creating in, in calculating embeddings, their nodes, and then, you know, in different uh, cycles, we keep you know, uh, uh, sharing our embeddings with uh, connected nodes and aggregate. If we do that in a, in a geo-distributed fashion, as I referred to, when, for example, the example we are working with different branches of Borealis, this is very, very time consuming. Uh, this is why I think we need, um, I, I was really brief about it, but we need these two levels, like maybe uh, doing graph neural network based on local, you know, uh, distribution of uh, embeddings and then uh, a global one, which is going to be like of more less weight in order to exchange embeddings. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sam. Indeed, it was very uh, informative. Can I have one question? Uh, I think that we are, uh, okay, you make it quick. Okay, uh, you have mentioned there are some that you have like uh, an interface for the uh, Sparkle queries. Do you have also a non-Sparkle interface for the people who are not familiar with uh, Sparkle? Uh, for, this is a good one. Uh, for now, we are only supporting through our library, easier to use APIs that we predefined, or you write a Sparkle query. Uh, okay. But this is a, a very good uh, catch because I would think this is uh, still in, in under investigation uh how can we convert uh, sql to sparkle sparkle okay you know yeah. now, there is some work in 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 the in the opposite direction like <laughs> yes. uh, converting the sparkle into sql but no this is interesting so we can allow data scientists who's familiar with sql to just write sql and then we convert it into sparkle to query our knowledge graph Yes, that would in be fact, perfect. Uh, I think uh, Mohammed, yeah. that we can also help in that since we already translate the Spark into Spark SQL uh, queries. Oh, this is interesting. So I, I should, uh, you know, we should maybe uh, discuss about that maybe offline. Sure. Thank you, sure, thank sure. you. A uh, big, massive, uh, sincere thank uh, for uh, your Sam and for all our brilliant uh, speakers today. Uh, Professor uh, Peter from uh, Kayset, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, Andreas from Uppsala University and the uh, Scale Out uh, Company, uh, Arnon uh, from uh, Riot Secure, uh, Sweden, and our last speaker, uh, Sam from Concordia uh, at uh, Canada. Uh, thank all of you for uh, accepting our uh, invitation and for uh, your timely uh, topics that you have discussed uh, today. Uh, just uh, a reminder, thank you, Andreas. Uh, a reminder that uh, the recordings will be uh, uploaded uh, soon to the website. Uh, also, this will be the final and last uh, seminar uh, this uh, year, 2021. Our next edition will be in uh, February uh, 2022, as I understand from our IT department. I also would like to extend our thanks to, to them. They, uh, they were working behind the logistics uh, of, uh, of the success of this uh, webinar. So for all of you, uh, thank you. And Mike, with you, Ahmed, if you have any uh, last yeah. Thank you for us. Uh, uh, thank you all for your participation and also for our brilliant speakers, uh, Andreas, Peter, uh, of course, Sam. Uh, was very rich discussion with diverse topics that are all still under the umbrella of uh, federated learning. Uh, I hope that you have enjoyed the, the discussions and uh, Yes, uh, the video recording will be uh, shortly on our website and also on YouTube. Uh, thanks also for the team from uh, from the University of Tartu for Annette for organizing and marketing all this uh, all the event and also the IT team were doing a great job. Uh, thank you and uh, yeah, have a nice evening. Uh, goodbye.